Chapter 10, Thinking in Objects. This is absolutely worth a let's go. And why? Because it's going to be super simple. Um, just what we're going to be covering is just really practicing some of the basic concepts we learned from Chapter 9, really reinforce, reinforcing some of these OOP paradigms. The previous chapter merely introduced objects and classes, and we covered many important concepts listed here, visibility modifiers, information hiding, the use of accessor and mutator methods, those getters and setters, a static versus instance, really important, understanding those static methods and static variables compared to their instance counterparts, and many other small nuances we've covered. The main objective of this chapter is really just to reinforce those things, to practice those things, to develop our thinking with this new OOP paradigm, and to try to illustrate how it's more effective, right, and more meaningful to help you solve problems, which means we're going to practice solving some problems. So here, diving right in, reminding us of this idea of class abstraction and encapsulation. Class abstraction is where we separate the implementation of a class from how the class is actually used. So you, the designer of a class, you will then describe the functions of the class, you'll describe how the class works, and you'll let the user, maybe the client or the customer who's paying you, you'll let them know how to use that class, how to access that class. But that collection of the, the public constructors, the methods, all of those data members, anything that's accessible outside of the class, along with how those things work, how they operate in more of a holistic sense, you're gonna explain that to the client, to that user, to that customer. And that's called the class's contract, construct. The user of the class, what's important here, is they don't need to know the inner details of how the class works. They don't need to know the implementation of the class. All they need to know is that class contract, contract, how you access the class, how you use the class, how you call the various, how you create objects, and then what methods are available for you to then call. So as mentioned previously, we really refer to the class itself as a black box in computer science, which really means it depicts that we don't need to know what's inside of it from the user's perspective, not the developer. Of course, the developer needs to understand it fully, but from the user's perspective, they don't need to understand the inner workings. It's a black box. And then over here, we have the client, the user of that black box, and they're going to be able to access that class through the contract of the class that you provide them. What is the contract? Again, it's those public methods and those constants that are available to the user to then access your class. And really, class abstraction and encapsulation are two sides of the same coin. And given here's an example of building a computer in real life. So you have all the various components of a computer. You go buy a motherboard, you get the newest i9 or whatever it is, CPU. You get some fancy expensive GPU. Um, you get maybe, you know, 32 gigs or more of memory if you wanted. You get a solid state drive. You get all kinds of fans and um, maybe even get all kinds of color stuff happening and RGB lighting, whatever it is you want. Each of those individual components can be viewed as an object with properties and with methods that can operate on that object, right? To get those components to work together for you to be able to build that computer, do you need to know the inner workings of the CPU? Or do you need to know all the details of their motherboard and how it was constructed? No, you merely need to know how the component is used and how those components interact with each other. You don't know, need to know the internal workings of each of those components. So we could say that the internal implementation, in fact, is encapsulated and it has been hidden from you. You can build a computer without knowing how each and every single compo component is implemented or internally designed. So where the previous chapters introduced procedural programming, the fundamental basics of programming that we've now learned, 
loops, methods, arrays, and then calling functions or calling methods, service level methods to perform tasks for us. Those chapters are very important and they lay a very uh, strong foundation for our OOP programming. But now classes and then the objects we create from those classes, they provide a much more high, a much higher level of flexibility and modularity for building reusable software. So what we're about to cover is several problems that we've seen previously from a procedural programming, which again, one more time, that's when we're basically building methods and then we call those methods, we send over parameters, and those methods return answers to us, right? That's traditional procedural programming. We're going to cover several examples we've already seen, but now we're going to view them within the OOP paradigm and the object-oriented programming approach to see the value of really coupling together data with the operations that perform on that data and to help us then develop this reusable code using objects and classes. The first example, consider writing a short program that would determine loan payments. You can make static methods, right? That would compute the monthly payments and then we could call those methods and send over data and get an answer and then try to print it. We could even write static methods to determine, you know, the total payments or how much how much of the life of the loan is left. But the problem with even making those methods is that we still have limitations. For example, what if you would like to associate a date with a particular loan? Now, you could try to make this happen, but there's no way within procedural programming, or certainly no good way, to really try to couple those things together unless we now go into OOP. So the traditional procedural programming paradigm is action driven. Data is separate from those actions, unfortunately. The OOP approach instead where the focus is now on objects, where each object has actions, has methods that can operate on that object. So now let's design this loan class. We're going to have these data members. We're going to have an interest rate. We're going to have number of years loan amount as well as loan date. So we're going to see that we can actually create a date object, something built in by Java that allows you to have a date object, kind of basic, but nevertheless, we're going to have a date object with this loan class as well. We're going to have the typical getters and setters as methods, but in addition, we're going to have other instance methods that belong to the object, right? We're going to have other instance methods that will work and operate on the specific data of this object. So what's the value proposition? Is that a loan object now contains both the data and the actions for manipulating and processing that data. So it's coupled together as opposed to being decoupled and separate. The data's over here, and now if we want to operate on it, we have to call these other methods and hope that they're going to return to us an answer. Now it's all coupled together within one class and within the objects we create from that class. So here's the UML for this loan class. We're going to have, again, the interest rate, the number of years, the loan amount, and then we're going to have this variable called loan date, which is merely a date object that Java provides for us. It's in the java.util library. Notice all of those will be private due to the minus signs. Here we have two constructors. One of them is going to be the default and the argument constructor. We have a second constructor, which receives the interest rate, the number of years, as well as the loan amount. It does not receive a date because we're going to create that date right then. We're going to create that new date object right then, which, which, will, be, which will include the exact system time when it was created. We're going to have your standard getters and setters, and then other necessary instance methods uh, that will operate on the loan, such as get the monthly payment and get the total payment. So a good exercise is to try to write a test program for this loan class just by looking at this UML right here, right? So if I were to give you the code for this UML and show you the inner workings the, of this black box, this loan class, of course you could then write a test program. But a nice challenge, and it's, you're going to see it's quite easy, 
is to actually write a test program for the loan class without even seeing the code of that loan class. And the value proposition is huge here because it demonstrates that we really have two things. We have the development of a class, and then we have the idea of using those the class. Two separate things. The creator, the developer develops that class. That's the class abstraction, the black box. We don't need to see that black box in order to now use the class. Because here, think of this as that class construct. Here we were provided with, hey, we have these getters and setters, they're all public. And we have this getter get monthly payment. And we also have a getter for the to get the total payment. So because we have those getters, then now we should be able to figure out as the end user, as the client, of how we can actually use this loan class without knowing what's actually inside that black box. So it also enables us to skip the, compl the complex implementation of maybe creating certain classes. Now this loan class wasn't so complicated, but it allows us to skip that component. And it's also easier to learn how to implement a class if you're already familiar with it by then using that class. So if we can use the class first, then we can go back and look at the implementation, the inner workings and be like, oh, I get that. That's kind of maybe cool and helpful. So now let's jump right over to NetBeans where I have this started. And I have the loan class, of course, already created, but we don't want to show it to you. We want to try to use that class. So in order to, instead of you watching me code this up, if you'd like, I would encourage you to pause the video, create this test loan class uh, project, throw in a scanner and these simple prompts to the user to enter an annual interest rate, uh, save it into variables, enter the number of years of the loan, save that into a variable and enter the loan amount and save that into a variable. So now we need to actually create a loan object. So let's come back to the contract. We can create a loan object using the default constructor. That's not really valuable. So instead, let's create a loan object by sending over the interest rate, then the number of years, and then the loan amount. So let's make a new loan object. Loan, let's call it L. Let's call it loan, just lowercase. Loan, loan equals new loan object. Now, what do we want to put in here? We want to put in here the annual interest rate. Annual interest rate. We want to put in here the number of years. And we want to put in here, finally, the loan amount. So we're using, we created a loan object without even knowing what's under the hood. And now we would like to display the date of that loan, which will be the exact date of the system time when I hit the, the run button. We want to display the date of that loan, the monthly payment, and the total payment. So here we have... To get the date, we have a get loan date. To get the monthly payment, we have a get monthly payment, and we also have a get total payment. So let's go ahead and do this. Loan, maybe you call it origination date. And let's just put a percent %s new line. And here we're gonna have loan.get. We can get, where is that at? Loan, get loan date. Now this will return to you, let's just run this really quickly so you can see what it returns. Oh, I gotta put in some values. 8.25, number of years, 10, and sure, it's gonna be a $400,000 loan. That is a huge interest rate. So it went ahead and returned this as a string, but I could have also done dot to string, and it'll do the same thing. Let me just run that again, and if I put Let's put about a 3.5% loan. Let's put a 30 year, if this was a mortgage, and let's enter the total, the total loan amount. Let's put 400,000 again. Loan origin, origination dates. You notice the, it's the exact same output. So when you do a dot get loan date, and we'll look at what's under the hood, it returns a date object, but when you print that date object, it automatically calls this two string method and we'll talk about why that happens a little bit later in another video. So you can explicitly call the dot to string method, which is a method on the date object. If you don't call it, either way it gets called automatically. Let's go ahead and also print the, what do we need to print? The monthly payment as well as the total payment. So here, 
I'm going to print the monthly payment. I'm going to space it over. Let's put a point to F new line. Loan dot get monthly payment. And then finally, we want to print the total payment. Total payment. I'm guessing this would be a payoff amount. Point to F new line comma loan dot get total payment. And let's run this. Hit run. Interest rate 3.5%. And the number of years 30. Let's make it a $350,000 loan. So we see here the monthly payment is this amount. The total payment over the lifetime of the loan, $500,000. And of course, here's the loan origination date. A couple of problems I see with that. I, I want to put a dollar sign here just right in front, make it look a little bit better. And I think that is more than sufficient here. So I'm going to, this will be 3.5, uh, 30 years, $350,000. And this is the actual results. And as I say that, there's only one other thing I would probably choose to change. And that is to put commas in here, make it look a little bit better. Is there a need? No, but come on, if you're, you're doing it, you like it to look right. So you put a comma right here, as we've seen between the percent and the point two. I think that's how you would do it. Let me run this 3.5%, uh, 30-year loan, and let's make this $350,000 for consistency. And there we go. This is the loan amount, and here's the monthly and total payment. So the purpose of this example was just to show you without even looking under the hood, which we can now do, here we can come under the hood, but without looking under the hood, what do we do? We used that black box, right? We accessed this black box via the contract. We created a new loan object, and then we printed out the details of that loan object. You could now come under the hood. You could see the constructors, right? Here's a nice use of this other constructor we showed you previously, where when we have two constructors, if you use the word this with a pair of parentheses inside one constructor, what you're really doing is calling another constructor, an overloaded, like overloaded methods, an overloaded constructor, and we're sending over the requisite, the requisite parameters to that overloaded constructor. So this 2.5, this is just saying if you make a no arg loan object, well, we're going to go ahead and give you a loan with 2.5 interest over one year and $1,000. Just for kicks. We could have initialized everything to zero. Here's how it was initialized. Uh, here we have getters and setters. And then finally, you have the math, and this is just a well-known equations of determining from the length of the loan, from their loan interest rate, uh, this is how you determine the actual monthly payment. Uh, and then finally, of course, the total payment. And here, the get loan date simply returns the actual address of our loan date object, which you can see was created here inside the constructor. So inside this constructor, we created a loan date object. And notice, I didn't actually have to do that up here in the no argument constructor. Why? Because the no argument constructor, in fact, called this constructor, which then inside it created a loan date object. So that was a great example of using that black box, using a class without having first already created that class. Let's do that again. So in chapter three, we saw how to calculate the BMI of a user. So the user would enter their weight in kilograms, their height in meters, and then a BMI is calculated and a message is printed to the user. Or the user could enter even weight, it would be easier depending on where you live, here in the States, weight in pounds, height in inches, and then have that BMI calculated. But how did we do that previously is after receiving the weight and the height from the user, we then called some static method, a method that belonged to the class, a service level method. We said, hey method, can you do this for me? And can you now return the BMI? Nothing wrong with that, but we have the data on the one side and we have the methods on the other that are operating on that data. Well, why not package that together inside an object? That's the OOP approach. We're gonna make an object that contains both the patient's information and the methods that operate on those data members. So here is 
our BMI class. Pretty basic. Of course, you could add more details to it. We have a name. We have an age, a weight, and a height. We have your standard uh, two constructors. And we have a variety of getters and setters, which are not even shown. It says the get methods for these data fields are provided in the black box in that blueprint in the class, but they are omitted from the UML diagram for brevity to make it easier, uh, more, uh, more succinct, uh, smaller for us to read here on the slide. No need to put all the getters and setters. Uh, so finally, we have the get BMI and a get status. The get BMI gives us the BMI of this particular patient and the get status gives us the status of really what that BMI means because that's just a number, right? Unless you have it memorized, what does the BMI of 22 mean? Um, is, that norm, is it normal weight? <laughs> Pardon me, normal weight or overweight, underweight, etc. That is the get status. So we want to be able to, in that same way we did that last loan example, we want to be able to code up these B, um, BMI objects and get the BMI and get the status without even looking at the blueprint at what's under the hood at that black box. So let's jump right to this. I'm going to come over here. Let me close the loan class. I have here, you can see, I made a test BMI class, which is a new project here in NetBeans. I want to make three BMI objects and then print their respective details. That's the goal right now. We want to use the black box before actually looking at the inner workings of that black box. So let's jump right in. Let's come back here to the actual UML and let's see that when I want to make a new BMI object, I will send over a name of the patient, the age, the weight, and the height. Or I could have just sent over name, weight, or height. We'll send over name, weight, and height. No need for age on this example. So here, I'm going to make a BMI object, BMI, let's call it oh, BMI, and let's call it patient, or let's call it P1 for patient one, uh, equals new BMI. <clears throat> and I need to send over three parameters. Notice it already gives me an error, which would tell you, as the client who's using this black box, that would tell you there is no, no argument constructor that was provided from the developer. There is not. Now we have these two constructors. So we're going to send over a name, a weight, and a height. And the weight and the height should both be, um, weight should be in pounds and the height should be in inches. So here as a name, what do I want to put as a name? Uh, John Doe, there we go, super creative. Uh, and then we have a weight, John Doe weighs 145 pounds. And what is the height of John Doe? How about five foot nine. So what is five foot? Five times 12 is 60. You can laugh at my math right now. Five times 12 is 60 plus nine inches. Let's say 69. And let us now run or let's print the information for John Doe. So we will say the BMI for John Doe percent S is percent so get BMI, it returns a double, okay? It's a number. It returns a double. So I'm going to go ahead and say percent point two F. And I know that what comes next is a status. That will say normal weight, overweight, underweight, severely underweight, obese, or what have you. So here I'm going to merely put percent string because it's returning a string representing that status, right? So we're reading the UML, knowing what it's returning, and now I'm accessing it and using it. So now I need to type patient one dot, I want to get their name, and then patient one dot, we want to get the BMI, and then finally patient one dot, we want to get their status. And let's see if we did this right. The BMI for John Doe is 21.41 normal. So here, once again, we have made a BMI object without looking at what's under the hood. Let's make another one. How about, let's call this Kaya, I need a name, look at the bookshelf, Kaufman, two, a, two Ks, works well. Kaya Kaufman. Kaya is 105, and let's say Kaya is like 5'4", so 105 might be tiny, too tiny. I don't know, I'm just guessing here, I don't know these numbers. Um, what is 5'4"? Five, 5 times 12, 60, 64. And let's make this, of course, patient 2. 
patient two, patient two. And of course, this has to be called patient two. That's why that had an error. And let's run it. Okay, that was a good guess. Underweight. So 5'4", yeah, I figured 105 was a little bit underweight. But again, that's just, I'm not the medical person. I don't know these things. I'm just developer writing some code. Um, P3, let's make another one. Um, who do we want to do now? Let us do, I don't know, um, Michael, did I spell that wrong? Michael Jordan. And how tall was Michael? I think Michael's 6'6". Six, six. So 72 plus your 6 is going to be 78 inches. I don't know what Mike was. I'm going to put 220. Um, and I think this is actually AE. So P3, P3, there's my age, right? Y'all ought to put like Steph Curry. Um, and let's now run this. Oh, no, there's no way Mike was overweight, so not 220. Um, so let's pretend Mike has gained some weight. There you go, in his older age. Um, so this is the idea, though is that we're using this BMI class, this blueprint, without actually needing to know what is in the black box. If we want to pull up the black box now, no problem, we can. Here we go. Well, this is what's under the hood. We have these calculations we, for us. We have these data members. We have these constants. These are static variables that belong strictly to the class. Uh, we have some constructors. And then we have getters and setters. And then finally, we have a get BMI, which determines that BMI using that equation. We don't need to know those details, right? Hiding, encapsulating those inner details from that user, that class abstraction, the client doesn't need to know this. They just want to know the results. And same thing for getting the status. So important to have this class abstraction where we create the class, that's that black box. And then using that class is independent from that and also seeing the value here of coupling together the data right these data members coupling that together with the methods and the operations that perform actions on that data super super important so that example demonstrates some of the advantages of object oriented the object oriented paradigm or approach over procedural programming right so procedural programming it focuses on designing methods. OOP focuses on the coupling of that data and the methods that perform actions or operate on that data. We want to couple those things together. And software that's designed using that OOP paradigm focuses on objects and the operations on those objects. Why is this valuable? For so many reasons we've already covered. The OOP approach, it combines the power of procedural programming with the added dimension that we're integrating data with the operations on that data. In fact, I'm going to come right here to the bottom. I'd say it mirrors the real world. It organizes, pro organizes a program in a way that mirrors the real world. In the real world, objects are associated with both the attributes and the data the, sorry, with attributes, with the data and the attributes and the actions that operate on that data. So that's the value of why we want to be trying to, to develop this thinking, this OOP thinking and trying to move away from procedural programming and get our minds into the OOP paradigm. One final example, and that is this course class. We want to make a course class where data members will be the course name an array of strings to store student names, then we want to make the number of students, which is simply going to be a static variable. The OOP approach, of course, we make all the variables. We then, sorry, this procedural approach, make the variables, make methods that we're gonna to call to maybe do things. But now the OOP approach is we're gonna couple all of that together. We're gonna to make these data members and we're gonna make these methods these instance methods that act on these data members. So what we're going to do different on this example is merely we're going to code up the blueprint. We won't even worry about using it. Now we're going to be the developer and we'll let the client use it later. So here we have the UML for this course class. Let's come right over here to NetBeans and let's make a new project. New project, next, and let's call this uh, demo course class, even though we're not going to do much of the demoing or any of it, but we need to go ahead and make this outer main 
so we can then create the class itself. So here's demo course class. Let me zoom in. We're not going to really put anything in here for now. But what we will do is make a new class called course. And now I merely hit finish. So here is our course class. Let me zoom in. And let's just start adding what we need for this. We have to have a course name, which is a string. And I'm not even going to type the word private. I will let NetBeans do all this for me. So string course name. And I have to have now an array of strings called students. An array of string called students. Number of students is an int. Int number of students. And I'll tell you what, I'm looking at where it said on the previous page that this should be static. I disagree with that. Um, maybe there's one way of thinking about it, but a static object would have been number of courses. That would write, keep track of the number of courses created. Number of students that are going to belong in this student array every time we add a new student to a course, that's not really a static object. That doesn't belong to the blueprint. That would belong to the object itself. So that will not be static. We're going to have some getters and setters. Now I'm going to go ahead and right now, let's see, it wants a constructor with just the course name. So let me go ahead and right, right click this, insert code, constructor with only the course name, generate. Uh, we don't need a constructor with the number of students um, or with student the student's array because that would, well, number of students would be, you know, we're not going to send over to the constructor the array of students or the number of students. When you create a new course, of course, that, that course will have no students in it. So I could say this dot number of students, number of students equals zero to initialize that to zero. But as you know, a primitive int data member will automatically get initialized to zero. No harm in putting this, but it automatically gets initialized to zero. So, but well, I'll leave it there. You know what? No harm, no foul. But now we need to create the array of strings to hold the student names. So here we've merely declared this array, right? Maybe I've jumped ahead too far. Let's come back here. Again, we have three data members. We're creating a course object. So the name of a course, the number of students in the course, and here is just going to be an array to store the names the, of, as a string of the individual students for that course, right? So we need to actually create that array. So here I will say students equals new string. And unless it's stated otherwise, they didn't give any details here. So we're the developer right now, right? So we're not the client, we're the developer. So these are the details we made for ourselves. We need to determine how big we want the initial size of this array to be. Let's assume you'll never have more than 30 students in your course. And that is our constructor. Let's put a comment here, data members, and then we have constructors or constructor. And then let's put some getters and setters. And let's see what we got. We want to have a get course name, get students, get number of students, but we're not having a set student or a set number of students or a set course name because the set course name is a one-off right here. There was no need to make that setter. Um, and we're not going to be setting the students. We're not going to set and send over an array of students. That's unnecessary. You have to think through, do we always need setters or even getters? And we're also not going to set the number of students because every time we ultimately call this method to add a student to the course, that's when we're going to increment this number of students data member. So really, we only need those three getters. So I'm going to right click here, insert code. I'm going to choose getters and setters. No, let me come back. I was tempted to put just the getters, but I was worried they may not have encapsulate. OK, it did have encapsulate. Cool. So getters for all of them. And I hit generate. Done. So it went ahead and made all these private, which is why I didn't want to type that word earlier. Just save a little bit of time. And there are our getters. Finally, we have other methods for this class. And what are those other methods? We have add student, and then we have drop student. Both of them are a void method. 
uh, add student will add a new student to this course drop student will drop a student from the course so let's come over here to add student and it's going to have a the parameters this is why I'm gonna put some comments for my method first method name add student parameters is a string the name of the student to be added return type is void right yep and description this method will add the student this add this add the add this student their name to the to the array of strings at the next index cool so here we go we have public and this is an instance method it's a void method public void add student was that the name add student string name I'm not gonna call it student string name okay so here we need to save imagine right now we have zero students right well we want to save this name into the students array right so it's just an array of strings we need to save the newest name into the students array at index zero well that's easy so save this student's name at the next spot in the student's array, in the student's array. So that's easy. I'm just going to say students at index zero, which is not correct, but I just want you to understand that for the moment, equals name. Don't know why the equals didn't press. So we're going to take this parameter name and we're going to save it into index zero. After we're done, what do we want to increment? We want to increment that, hey, we've now added another student. So now we want to increment the number of students data member. Does that make sense, right? So now we're going to have one student. And check this out. Next time when we add a student, where are we going to add them? at index one, and then we're gonna increment num students and it will be two. And think about where I'm going with this. The next time, some of you are like, I don't know where you're going. The next time when we add a new student, they're gonna go, and you're like, oh, I get it. They're gonna go at index two, which means really we can put here students at index number of students. And that's the overall code for adding a student. We're going to save at the beginning number of students is zero. We're going to save the name to number of students of the students array. And then we're going to increment the number of students. That's the method. Let's copy all of that so we don't have to recreate the wheel here. And enter, enter, paste. And now let's call this drop student. This one requires a bit more thought. The name of the student to be dropped from this course return type is void this method will drop this student to the or from the from the course let's put now some details of really what that means this means the student's name will be removed from the student's array hmm there's some thought to happen here now. So of course this is drop student. We need to do what in order to make this happen? We need to search the array and determine if this student is even in the course, right? That's what you really wanna do is determine if the student is even in the course, which we could have made just another method uh, search for student to see if a student is in the course and that method we could have returned a boolean and then and only then maybe call this drop student method that may be a more appropriate design and as i say that out loud 
I like that. I'm looking at the time. We're good. I like that. So I want to go ahead and very quickly do that. I want to make a method called public boolean search for student string name. And so what are we going to do? Loop over, not the students array. It is over the students. I'll put loop over the students array, but only over the number, the current number of students. Because if, if the array is size 30, but you only have four students from zero to three, we don't need to loop over all 30, right? So we're gonna do a for loop. We're gonna loop over the current number of students, and we're merely gonna check if students at index i dot equals name do what? Return true. Else, oh, return true. And if we never return true at the end of that for loop, if we make it till here, this means the student name was not found, therefore return false. Cool. So now we can just assume that student is already in the array and we're gonna search for the student. Ooh, I already like something even better now. So instead of returning true or false, <laughs> we're making this even nicer, um, how about we return the index where that student was found? Because otherwise I'll have to go search again right here, which is not a problem. Like I have to just search again right here. I know the students exist because I will only call the drop student method if they exist. So I would, I would have to now search again for that index. So instead of returning true, how about I return an int that's going to return the i index where it was found if it was not found, return minus one. That's a little bit nicer. So now, either way, if it returns zero or a positive number, I know the student was found in my main when I actually demo this, or if it returns a minus one, it was not found. And I would only call the drop student if it was actually found. So I'm gonna even change, so I'm changing some of this. Maybe I developed this UML and I'm like, you know what? I want to change it a bit because I like something newer as I'm coding this live. I want to send over int index index where found, something like that, or index, you know, index where found. So now that I have that index, I can send that over here and I can directly just access that index. So I, I could code it that way, which makes it a lot easier, but you know what? Just to say, in case people want to see different ways, I'm going to go make this back to a Boolean. I'm jumping around, but that's okay. You can see different ways to solve the same problem. True and false. Just in case people don't follow of what I was doing uh, as sending that index back and then sending it over to the drop student. So here, I won't send an index, which means I need to do what? Search again, loop over the array for the student, but we know the student exists. And what are we really doing? We're looking for search the array and determine the index of this student. So in, uh, int index where found equals, I'm gonna say a minus one. Uh, we know it equals something other than minus one because if we've made it to the drop students array, again, we've already confirmed the student exists. So here, if the student of i dot equals name, I'm gonna say index where found equals i. And in fact, I can go ahead and break at that point out of the loop. So now we know where that student was found, right? We know, for example, that the student was found at index four. What does that mean? How do we delete that student? Well, we're gonna reduce the number of students, that's for sure. But how do we delete that student? What we really need to do is imagine that we have, here's your array, and it goes up to, again, index 29. Here's index 0. So imagine we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's just say that we know that the student is here, right here at index 2. That's where the student is. So we have some names. I'm not going to put some names or maybe I will. I'll just put some letters for the names. Here's letter B for maybe Bob, K for Kaya, M for Marie, 
J for Jonathan. Four, what comes in four? Who's in four? Four is going to be a K for something else, and five is going to be Xavier. So we want to delete this person here at index two. Well, how do we actually delete that person at index two? Is we need to move this person over, then this person over, and then this person over, right? And then we will have effectively overwritten what is at index two, right? Index two will become a J, right? So instead of this M, this J will come right here. I'm writing hard so you can see it. This K will come here and this X will come here. Now we don't need to worry about deleting this X because what we're gonna do is we're gonna reduce the number of students and therefore the program's only really gonna consider those first five values. So if you know, here's the point, let me back up some. So if you know that the value, the index of the student that you want to delete, if you know that index is right here, we can use that fact in creating a for loop. We need to loop starting, we could say starting at this value, and we can see how many times do we need to loop here? We need to loop three times. Well, how did we get that three? That's where you gotta think about. We need to loop three times, but we can see that we can visually see there's three more, but how would you have done that in your code? Well, you would have known that there are a total of six students, right? And we know we need to loop three times. So how do you get that three? Well, here we're at index two. So you could say, well, six minus two, well, that's gonna give you four. And then if you took a guess and you said minus one to give you three, that would really be correct. So if you took the number of students, which is six, minus the index where it was found, two, right? And then minus one, that would give you the number of times you need to actually iterate. So let's translate that to a little bit of code here. Let's delete what we have. I want to do a for loop. And we want to loop from the index where it was found all the way to number of students. And let's come back to that example and see if that even makes sense. If you want to loop from, let me erase all of this stuff, the index where it was found, which is two, all the way to the number of students is six, but we're going to go less than six. Well, two, three, four, five. That would be four iterations, which is too much. We need three iterations. So what can we do if we need three iterations? I'm not going to actually start here at index where found. Instead, I'm going to start at index where found plus one. And that's going to be three iterations. And I'm merely going to say students at index i minus one equals students at index i. And I'm shifting over those students. And then finally, decrement the number of students in the students array. So get nope, number of minus minus. All right, that's longer. I'm three minutes over. I want to cut this short. That is your drop student. The only purpose of this example was what? We wanted to be the developer. Look at this UML and design our own class. What we've done is we've simply covered a variety of examples to help us improve our OOP thinking, see the real value proposition of object-oriented programming as opposed to procedural programming. As always, it's been fun. Take care, everyone.